Our next speaker is Thompson Benez. And I'm going to give author credit on this intro to Renown. I've come to find out, but I like it, so I'm going, to, I'm going to use it. When Thompson puts his mind to something, he puts his whole self into it. His project included an incredible amount of data that needed to be analyzed, and without any data management or analysis experience prior to the program, what he has done has been nothing short of amazing. <laughs> when he came across a roadblock in his analysis, he didn't simply decide it wasn't worth it. He learned the ins and outs of so many new programs, and in addition to being useful for this project, he's about to present but that are going to make him a valuable asset in fisheries management wherever he ends up next. So Thompson's project is entitled Breathing Deep, Examining Short Fin Mako and Blue Shark Movements in Relation to the Southern California Bite Oxygen Minimum Zone. Did you know there's a place in the ocean where some fish can't breathe? This place is called the Oxygen Minimum Zone and where I chose to focus my time during the MAS MBC program. The OMZ is a layer of low oxygen that reduces fish habitat by squeezing them to the surface and in effect condensing the fish we want to catch with those we're trying to protect, like marine mammals, sea turtles, and sharks. For example, imagine you had a two-story house with a handful of kids. When they start to get a little crazy, you send the troublemaker to their room and the issue is resolved. Now imagine you have the same handful of kids in, in a studio similar to my place in PB. There's, <laughs> there's no way to separate the troublemaker. The same is true for the OMZ. With the reduction in suitable habitat, it becomes harder to separate the target from non-target catch. To paint a better picture, I created this 3D visualization of my study area within the Southern California Bight. This top layer represents the depth of the OMZ. The red indicates where the OMZ is shallower, and the blue indicates where the o top of the OMZ is deeper. Notice the OMZ is shallower, closer to shore, indicated by the purple polygon, and deeper, indicated by the yellow polygon. As I tilt the visualization, you can start to see the bottom of the bite in relation to the surface of the OMZ. To be clear, I just, to be clear, this is just the top extent of the OMZ, and the entire layer goes to about here where these two green dots are. So this whole layer um, isn't suitable for fish with high oxygen demands. To complicate the issue, the depth of the OMZ is changing due to human-induced climate change. The map here from Bograd et al. illustrates that rate of change. The blue indicates areas of little change, and the brown indicates area of high change. <clears throat> um, and again, I want to point out that OMZ is squeezing fish to the surface closer to shore where most interaction with fishing effort is likely to occur. I'm, I'm interested in looking at how the rising OMZ might affect blue and mega shark movements in the Southern California Bight. The two sharks make an interesting case study because sh both sharks end up in the California drift gill nets but have key fundamental differences. The short fin mako is able to warm itself and in turn can tolerate deep cooler water at the cost of requiring additional oxygen to maintain that heat. On the other hand, blue sharks are not able to regulate body temperature and therefore are likely limited more by cooler, deeper water and have a high tolerance to low oxygen. It would be similar to comparing your ability to breathe at the top of a mountain or lack thereof coming from sea level to someone who's been living at altitude for an extended period of time. To look at this question, I've been fortunate enough to work with a large data set of tagged blue and mako sharks from the NOAA fisheries. The sharks were tagged with pop-off archival tags. You can see one here, um, which records temperature, pressure, and light over the duration of the deployment, and then pops off and transmits a summary of data to, the, to a satellite. But if you're lucky enough to recover this little tag from the vast ocean, a seemingly impossible task, you are rewarded with fine-scale minute-by-minute data over the length of the deployment. The sharks in this study were also tagged with satellite-linked radio transmitter tags. You can see one on the dorsal fin here, um, which produce accurate horizontal movements of the sharks. But, as, but neither of these t sharks, excuse me, neither of these tags record oxygen concentrations. To give you a better picture of the data I started with, here's a map of all the spot positions for all the tagged Mako and Blue Sharks. The Blue Sharks are shown in blue and the Mako's in red. However, of all the spot locations, I decided it would be best to limit my study area to the Kalkofi grid shown here by the yellow and purple polygons. I did so for three main reasons. First off, the Southern California Bight is the main focus of the current West Coast swordfish fishery and where most, of, most Mako's and Blue Sharks are caught incidentally. The heat map here shows the D&G fishing effort from 1990 to 2014. And you can see the focus of effort is here in the Southern California Bight, which means there'll be ample fisheries data, and my results could have an impact, 
a direct impact in the area where most of these sharks are caught incidentally. Second, most of the tags, <clears throat> most sharks tagged in and around the Kalkofi grid, shown here by the dots color-coded by month tagged. Therefore, the recovered pat, therefore, there are more recovered pat tags in the study area, which I explained may be a needle in a haystack to put it lightly, but these recovered tags provide the level of detail I needed to compare the difference in species oxygen preferences. Third and most importantly, the Kalkofi grid has a long-running systematic set of oxygen over the same period as the tagging took place. <coughs> As I mentioned, the PAT tags do not have an oxygen sensor, and recent attempts to do so have proved difficult. To supplement the lack of oxygen data, I linked three mako and three blue sharks to cow coffee stations, shown here by the dots, to make inferences on the shark's oxygen preference. The grid was split along the 60th cow coffee station, here, to generate near and offshore bins. I chose the 60th station because it indicates the edge of the continental shelf, and the, and the near shore band captured with the OMZ is shallowest, and has the highest rate of change. Okay, here we have the depth distributions of four double tagged blue and six double tagged makos separated into near and offshore zones. On the y axis, I have depth been every five meters down to 200 meters, and on the, excuse me, on the y axis, on the x axis, I have percent time. You can see um, night indicated by the dark bars and daytime indicated by the light bars. Again, blue sharks are blue and mako sharks are red. You can see that most time, both near and offshore, blue and mako sharks are concentrated in the top 10 meters of the water column, and decreasing down to about, until you get to around 100 meters. <clears throat> As I pop, excuse me, once the sharks move offshore, less time is spent concentrated at the surface, but typically remain above 50 meters. As hypothesized, blue sharks spent more time than makos below 200 meters, which could be indicative of more hypoxic tolerant characteristics. For the sake of time, I want to highlight the fine scale movements of one blue and one mako shark linked to cow coffee stations, which overlap in time and space. Again, I've <clears throat> again we have the cow coffee grid as a study area, where red represents the areas where the OMZ is shallower, and dark blue represents the areas where the OMZ is deeper. You can see that the sharks tend to avoid areas where the OMZ is shallowest, but do not favor areas where the OMZ is deepest. The gray highlighted sections of track shown here illustrate both sharks milling around about Catalina on the same week. I'm going to focus on this week. For, <clears throat> I'm going to focus on this week of overlap for the next few slides. Flipping the last image on the x-axis, we have the vertical movement at each of the two sharks over the same week. Depth is on the y-axis down to 500 meters, and y, and time on the x. The gray bars indicate night, which can be used to break apart the individual days. Behind the shark tracks, you can see the blue gradient indicating various oxygen concentrations. The darkest blue indicates the OMZ. You can see here that over the same week, the blue shark made frequent dives to low oxygen environments. On the other hand, the mako shark remains close to the surface where oxygen is plentiful. You can see the mako swimming closer to the island shown here by the depth of the seafloor. To incorporate temperature into the story, I color coded each of the pat tag points from tag temperature sensor. The lighter yellow and green indicate the warmer water and blue and purple indicate cooler water. As you would expect, as the sharks dive deeper, they experience cooler water. The blue shark again seems unfazed by the cool temperature and low oxygen. To get an understanding of individual dives, I've zoomed into each of the tracks. The vertical movements of both species of shark are characterized by a shallow U-shaped dives where the shark remains at approximately 50 meters for a period of time before returning to the surface. Conversely, the deep dives create a V pattern where the shark returns immediately after reaching depth. This V-shaped dive could characterize a point where the shark has reached its physical limit either due to temperature or hypoxia and must return to the surface waters where the temperature is warmer and the dissolved oxygen is higher. So we have V dives here. We also get a shallow U-shaped dive here. To be clear, I don't want it to seem like I'm cherry-picking the data to say that makos never enter low areas of low oxygen. I just thought it would be useful to see an example of horizontal and vertical movement of two species that overlap in space and time. But of all but all the tracks are highly variable at the species and individual level. To increase the sample over the entire length of tracks, I used R to calculate the quantity and duration of dives into the oxygen minimum zone per species per dive. To do so, I compare the time entered, the, entered and exited the OMZ, shown here by the double-headed arrows. Over the length of all the tracks, blue sharks entered the OMZ three times more than the mako sharks, and blue sharks had a max duration dive twice that of the makos again suggesting that blue sharks could be more tolerant of low oxygen environments. The column graph here shows the percent time of tag deployment under each oxygen surface as calculated by minute below each layer divided by the total tag deployment. 
So I have blue sharks on this side and mega sharks on this side here. And you can see the blue sharks percent of their tag deployment spend more time under each of the oxygen zones that I've created. Um, this blue shark from 2008 has been in an order of magnitude more than any of the other sharks under the OMZ. Um, I believe that's likely because it's a large male over 250 centimeters and the short, the tag deployment was about 12 days. So it could be a bit biased. I see my results as positive yet precautionary. The good news is this California swordfish fishery is using spatial separation to target non, tar, separation of target and non-target species to move away from blue and mako catch. As you can see here, the regulations put in place to lower the nets dramatically reduces the amount of time either of the sharks, either of the blue sharks or makos spin within the drift gill net zone, shown by these bars across the depth distribution of vertical track, and therefore reduces their time and likelihood to be entangled. So before and after. You can really see that there's a reduction in time of the nets are overlapping the shark's movements. It's pretty cool. Better yet, the transition to buoy gear further exploits the gap in vertical distribution. Highlighted by the green bar, on the distribution histogram and the blue shark vertical tract, fishermen are able to set their hooks at depths lower than 200 meters with the swordfish spend a significant amount of time, but the blue and mako sharks do not. And in effect, reducing bycatch. However, if climate models are correct and the OMZ continues to rise, the swordfish will be compressed closer to the surface where it will be more difficult to separate target from non-target species, resulting in increased bycatch. If this is the case, regulations could be put into place to move the already reduced swordfish fleet offshore where the OMZ is deeper and the fish are less compressed. Such regulation could create an environment in which the California support swordfish fishery could no longer sustain the cost nor compete with foreign vessels. The result would be the loss of American jobs and an increase in imports, some of whose fleets record higher interaction with sharks, turtles, and marine mammals. And with that, I would like to thank my capstone committee, Russ Vetter, Heidi Dewar, Nicole Nasby Lucas, and Heidi Batchelor for all their Wonderful help, I couldn't have done it without any of you. Um, as well as Barbara Mewling for her unlimited R support and Samantha Murray for calling me up. And thank you. All right, do I have any questions? Oh, somebody, oh, Travis. That's a great question, and a lot of that work's done by Chugi. Um, and what they're finding out is, so we can go back to the slides. Um, the new deep set gear does seem promising when you're fishing between like 270 to 320 meters, and they are seeming like they can catch a lot of swordfish, but they're, you're correct in the sense that they're not catching as many as they would have with the uh, drift gill nets. But I think a lot of the argument is um, there's so much pushback against the drift gill nets that if we don't find alternative gear that we're going to have to shift, shift swordfish um, to, uh, we're going to import our swordfish from other countries. I think that's the big focus here is that we're trying to create gear so we don't have to shift that domestic demand away where, where other countries are going to catch more sea turtles and sharks. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, it's really hard to see with the light. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so Russ and I are working, as well as Heidi, um, thinking about making a paper about, on this. Um, yeah, and I just hope to continue this into the future. Any other questions?